My name is Brian Miller. I'm the founder and president of Aetna Interactive, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, Secrets That Will Save Your Reputation. Uh, I want to take just a moment and introduce you both to myself and to our panelists. I'll talk briefly about each of them as they enter their sections, but I'm very excited today to have um, three people that I know professionally, that I, I respect greatly, and who really I regard as experts, both in the area of um, uh, online reputation, reputation in general, um, consumer and patient perception, and practice management and customer service. So today we are joined by Marie Olison of Real Patient Ratings, Tom Siri of Real Self, and Glenn Morley of Karen's Upco and Associates. Um, I want to explain, though, before we get too far into the, the webinar, why it is that I've assembled this particular group of people. Uh, for those of you that know myself, that are familiar with that interactive, you know that we um, talk a lot about online reputation management. It is uh, an area in which we service a large base of aesthetic clinics uh, around the world. And you know what we had to do, because we believe in rigor, is we had to look at where and why these complaints were appearing for, for aesthetic practice in general. And, and what we said, and we've done a number of quantitative analysis, but we wanted to do something new this time. And we did a qualitative analysis very recently. And we looked at specifically online complaints for 100 aesthetic clinics. Now, um, we, I know we have some attendees today on from Canada. Um, our sample group was from the US. But I'm going to hazard a guess that the qualitative analysis in Canada would have been very similar. Now, we looked at two very particular sites. We looked at Google Plus and Vitals. Now, um, both Tom Siri uh, and, and Marie Olison um, and their business, they'll, they'll talk about their unique approach to collecting patient feedback and patient reviews. Um, and their approaches are very different than these sort of open public forums. Um, but given the high visibility of both, that's where we did our research. And we looked at the reviews and the content of those reviews on Google where there were less, uh, the rating was less than four out of five stars. So uh, uh, someone who was just basically satisfied or unsatisfied. And then on Vitals, where there was a four-star system, we read, carefully read and analyzed the content of those reviews um, that were less than three stars in score. And then we found that we had to come up with a system to categorize all that feedback. And we broke it out by concerns related to time, concerns related to um, communication, to money, and to clinical results. And because we're doing this qualitative analysis, one negative review could easily have counted in more than one of those categories. And so um, when we, we look at this, we wanted to kind of say, well, what really were the big takeaways? Now, the, the first thing we noticed is that of the clinics that we sampled, 53% had no reviews. So more than half of clinics had no review yet at all. And of those that had reviews, so the 47% that actually had some review content, there were fewer than five reviews. Now, this might be taken as, um, as evidence that reviews really aren't important. And I actually would say that it's, it's quite the opposite that your active orientation around reviews is incredibly important because, well, for both of these reasons. Um, the 53% have no reviews are literally one bad review away from, from really having a horrible reputation in the eyes of the online public. And that for those that uh, the vast majority of practices that have fewer than five, your entire reputation online um, is really being captured by this very small sample of patient feedback. And so the concern here isn't so much that reviews aren't relevant, it's that practices aren't engaged enough around encouraging a representative sample of their patients to share their experience. And interestingly, um, you know, we hear a lot of people say that only really unhappy patients write reviews, and I can't motivate happy patients to do it. And that's maybe halfway true, at least according to the sample that we looked at. You know, I know that both Tom and Marie have very different perspectives because of the different way that, that they collect data. But in our sample, of the clinics with reviews, only about half were generally positive. So uh, more than 75% of the reviews um, were positive in nature. And so it, it's, it's, I think, a call to action for everybody who's on the phone to really talk actively with patients about how much you value their honest feedback, um, both directly to your practice and online. Now, what we found in this sample about the nature of patient dissatisfaction is why I brought this panel together. And what we found uh, quite um, 
quite simply, it's just that communication concerns, concerns related to um, managing patient expectations, to serving patients properly, to um, talking with them in a way that's respectful and informative, really won out. And in fact, the two most popular things that we saw were communication and time. And what these both have in common is that for the most part, um, the time-related concerns were things like I had to wait too long for my appointment or the physician rushed through my consultation. And for the most part, these are things that actually precede any kind of treatment being issued to the patient at all. And in the sample, if we combine communication and time concerns, you are eight times more likely to be slapped online with a negative review for communication or time-related issues than you are for anything related to value or a clinical outcome. Patients, when they're being critical for the most part in the sample we saw, were being critical of service, not critical of you as, not, as a doctor. So that's why I have brought our panelists together to talk a little bit about what their experience is around these service-related concerns um, and what we might do about them. The first of our panelists I'm actually really excited to have with us is Tom Siri. He's the founder and CEO of Real Self. I think probably everybody on the call is familiar with it. And it's, uh, right now, it's the world's most visited aesthetics website that's targeting consumers. It was founded back in 2006. And really, I think Tom and his team, the goal there was to create a trusted information resource um, that includes not only patient perspective, but more than a million posts from those core four special, uh, specialties of doctors. Um, I, you know, Tom has an amazing background with Expedia, but what I'm going to do now is I'm just I'm going to turn it over to Tom. He can share a little bit about himself and dive right into his content. Tom, I'm going to go ahead at this point, and I'm going to give you those keyboard and mouse controls and ask you to take the show. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I am in Seattle, Washington, and my neighbor, uh, we're in the city, and my neighbors decided to power wash his sidewalk. So if you hear a sudden surge of noise, um, be assured that we're getting clean sidewalks in Seattle. Um, so thank you, Ryan, very much for introducing me and, and for inviting me today. This is is a, a topic that you and I have spent a lot of time on panels on, and, and it's always fun to sort of have an opportunity to sort of develop these programs together, and, and it's, it's just going to be fun to talk about. Um, so let me, there we go. Um, as, you, as you kind of alluded to, you know, my background, I just want to give a little quick um, sort of context to where, I, where I've come from and, and where Real Self has sort of arrived um, out of is, you know, basically, um, my career on the online world started um, right in the dot-com days in the like, 98, 99 time frame where I worked for Expedia where we were really looking for ways to build a brochure you could believe, uh, an entity where you get past the, the, um, past the travel agent and be able to make better decisions in travel. Um, so um, that, that sort of history there um, led me to um, decide to start Real Self which was really designed around the same notion of empowering consumers and give them a way to access information, make confident decisions, and um, freeing them up from just having to look at a brochure that told them everything would be perfect and to some of the, some of the actuals that are out there that there's a range of possibilities associated with aesthetics. Um, and more recently, we've been adding in more and more of a platform of approach where we're helping doctors also build their brochure that, can, that consumers can believe that's based on their own expertise and patient testimonials, which we're going to speak to today. So the reason why we're probably on this call is you could probably blame Amazon, which is also a Seattle-based company. Um, and really, they've inserted in, into the psyche of the American public and, and, and increasingly international mindset that no matter what the purchase, no, even in the mundane as a blender, as significant as a, a trip, or even more significantly, a cosmetic procedure, we're sort of accustomed to this idea that reviews are there to help guide us along on making these decisions. And so um, it just becomes sort of a part of commerce. And, uh, and, and the information that reviews is, is far more than just a star rating. Um, for any of you who've used Amazon, which I would say probably almost every on this, everyone on this call, and have used reviews like TripAdvisor, which I would say a large portion of this audience probably has as well, um, it's the information that's inside the reviews that's really critical and important and informational and helpful. 
So it goes beyond the star rating. The star rating is sort of a signal, um, but we look for context and information that's inside of these, these postings to help make a better decision, like where's the best room at a hotel. Um, and, and so oftentimes people have called what commerce is really shifted toward is sort of a social commerce, where we're using social information, information produced by peers, by complete strangers, by experts, and they help validate we're making good decisions before we make them. Um, so it's a very common fabric you see across e-commerce, but also, as you know, in your lives, across cosmetic procedures and surgery and patients and how they select doctors. Um, and and it, the reason why it's particularly important, the, these sort of peer-to-peer um, -peer feedback points are significant to the cosmetic patient is she's been doing research for a long time. So the typical consumer um, is, is spending multiple uh, months, if not years, looking through everything they can find to put doubt away, to overcome fears, and to feel confident they're going to make a good, smart decision. So. You know, of our data, of our population, you know, we ran a sample of our consumers, um, and the survey showed that you know about half of them were spending, have been all so far, have been already researching online for a year, and in that year, um, what they're really gravitating toward is um, learning from the experiences of others and using that information again to feel strength in their decision, feel confident. And, and associate them their uh, decision with somebody who has been there and done that before. Um, and and to, to echo what Ryan just pointed out in the data set that they looked at at Aetna, um, if you look at the real self data where we have 18,000 practices across um, the U.S. And, and Canada and parts of Europe, 90% um, of those practices have fewer than five reviews, so pretty close to what um, to what Ryan just shared there, and um, and even in cases where um, you know you could say, well, maybe that's a figment of, of real self. Well, we looked at just anecdotally or qualitatively Yelp and said, well, what does Yelp look like for the heart of Yelp, which is they're based in San Francisco. There's probably more Yelpers in San Francisco than any other city, for sure there are. And here's the Yelp listing for the number one most reviewed doctor in San Francisco who's a cop under their their heading of cosmetic surgeon has 51 reviews. Um, and then you can imagine it drops off considerably after you get past the first 10 doctors into the single digits. So this is a phenomenon that exists across the entire web that there's just not a body of data that's out there um, that is significant. And, and as scientists, um, many of you can appreciate that the problem here is a simple one of math, and which is um, if you have a small customer base, which you do relative, say, to Amazon and their blender sales or a, a hotel like the Hyatt in Chicago, um, you you're have fewer number of possibilities of people are going to come back to the web and write about their experiences, A. And B, you're facing a, a consumer interest that is not to share their information. It's, they value privacy. They value anonymous nature of what they're doing. They want people to say, you look great, but they have no idea why you look great. And so this leads to a high margin of error, and if you were to try to overcome this error, you would need a lot of reviews, hundreds of reviews, to really have a representative sample of what your, what your practice is truly delivering. So, um, so what, as, as Ryan also said here, which is if you only have those you know, two reviews on a platform or 10 reviews on the entire internet, Yes, a, a review like this is going to really sting and could cause real tremendous reputation damage to you. Now, if you have 100 to 200 reviews out there, which you know, many doctors have been able to do, um, it, it becomes something where it becomes a nuisance. It becomes something that's a concern. It's something to evaluate. But it's not something where there's this sudden strike fear of, I, I can't get out of bed in the morning because this is so terrible what it's done to my reputation. Um, now, the, the answer isn't necessarily just one of quantity, so I want to make sure that that's something that I speak a lot about and I'm very passionate about, is that consumers don't value quantity of reviews, they value quality and quantity on top of that. But in this is an example here of a screenshot where, you know, just a one-liner of, I think my doctor's great, is not enough information to help her feel any more confident that you're the right doctor for them. And it may just send a signal that, wow, it looks like this doctor is just gaming this system, which is actually a negative on your reputation, even though it's a star, a positive star rating. 
And, and in the words of one of our, our consumers who um, we get a lot of feedback from our user base of over four and a half million visitors a month, and one of these people just made a statement, which I thought was great, which is that they felt that they really couldn't use thin content that is like the one-liner, doctor is wonderful, to help feel good about their decision on that doctor. So it just wasn't super helpful. And it's probably pretty, that makes pretty good sense for you if you're thinking about any other purchase and looking at ratings. And it's, and it's sort of very similar to a doctor's website. You know, Aetna builds gorgeous websites with deep information for a reason because they know consumers need to go beyond just where the doctor went to school. So this is just a screenshot of a surgeon who um, has, uh, has been working with one of my family members. And, you know, here's the, he's in a hospital system, and this is all I could really find about him. This is his website. And it feels like it's 10 years old, and probably is. But it just isn't enough information to give anyone the sense that this doctor is an expert, they're thoughtful, caring, and going to deliver awesome care to our, to our family member. So context of the star rating really does matter, so much so that consumers are spending significant more time looking at the reviews than they do at your information. So this is just data from real self, and we see you know, it's, you know 185,000 hours spent um, last month just looking at reviews versus 16,000 and change looking at um, the actual doctor profile information. Um, so, so what we've seen, and it's sort of an organic process, and it's really been interesting to watch at Real Self, is that consumers have really sort of started to move into a direction where they're finding content that is rated about ratings and reviews is, is interesting, but where they really gravitate toward our stories. And so where reviews migrate into stories where people talk about and update and give information and photos and so forth, we see in our data that those stories get six to ten times more performance for the, the doctor in terms of clicks to their website and so forth because it's so much more engaging. And so you see this on Real Self in our storytelling, and it's really featured in the photos, and not just here's a sample. But um, um, these, these areas where consumers are taking the time is pretty remarkable, and people have asked, well, how do you get people to post their photos? And like, they do it, did it on their own, and they've been doing it on their own for years. And, and I don't have a great answer. All I know is that it's like an oasis for people who are trying to get over the, over the finish line for, say, a tummy tuck to see the full detail day by day, week by week, month by month, through the recovery of a procedure. And, and, and these, these storytellers, these people who reach this higher pinnacle of, of engagement and participation about um, what is, used to be a review has been morphed into a story, are very committed to these postings. Um, so half of them are coming back and updating the reviews, saying, here's my latest status. Or they're commenting against the review, which means they're responding to people who have other uh, sort of questions for them. Or, you know, and, and then over a third are doing both. And, and they do it for a pretty long period of time. Um, so they retain, this is sort of a, the, the decay curve of how long a person stays engaged in the review. And so the number's a little small, but the point is just to show that even after three months post-op, after posting their story about their procedure, we see consumers coming back, 21% are coming back and, and, and updating. And you can see it drops off after people, you know, after 52 weeks, you know, we're getting down to a smaller number of participants on their own review. But it just shows you the power of these stories that it, it, it carries on beyond just the, the initial, what I thought about my doctor. And it's really about, a story here is about support. They get support from others across the decision process. Um, so Ryan um, looked, looked at his data qualitative, and we did the same. We looked at reviews qualitatively, and we said, well, what are people saying in these stories? And our data is a little bit different, when, and, and I don't have answers for this, and I think Marie Olson is going to speak, could maybe speak better to these, these sort of insights, because she's closer to the practice in, in finding out what are drivers of, of satisfaction and service, service issues. But we definitely saw that people claimed to have a bad outcome, a bad result, an unsatisfactory outcome, where the chief reason why they had posted negative reviews. So the, uh, negative reviews, we looked at about 750. And then we dug into it and looked at by treatment and saw, well, is this true for across many different types of invasive and non-invasive treatments? And sure enough, it's pretty consistent that um, people who are posting a, a, a one or two star review on real self are pretty unhappy with the outcome. And you could argue maybe that's because of poor communication or poor post-op support. Again, I would defer to Marie on that. I don't have a great speculation on that. 
there's some good news though, and I just um, I want to be cognizant. I'm, I'm I'm running a little long on time, so I just want to say you know, you can updates and reviews happen not just on real self but on Yelp and other platforms. So you can correct a wrong, and people know you're human. So if it's a simple service problem where people are like, hey, I got overcharged, it can be corrected and can flow through and turn a very negative review into a positive review. And the other piece of good news is that you're doing a good job. So um, in our data, 89% of you are getting four or five stars for your reviews, and it's following this distribution curve that looks like a J curve, which is actually very similar to what you see on Amazon for their products. So consumers holistically, in my opinion, and are more likely to share positive and negative because they sort of have a purchase bias that they made a good decision initially and they want to just share the world that they, they're a smart person basically. So and this same distribution is something that um, anecdotally looking at a few doctor profiles in San Francisco for Yelp, same kind of view. Um, the last point I want to make and I think this is sort of not so obvious to, to, this, to, to, to what is reputation management is that Reputation management is very much, you know, people talk about the star rating, but there's, what about the things that don't get rated? And in the case um, that we see most poignantly here at Real Self is that the biggest silent killer of reputation is failure to respond to interested patients. People who are over that finish line saying, I want to reach your office, but you can't, but they don't hear back in a timely manner. So we see that 80% of the inquiries that are sent to doctors from Real Self take over a day to respond. And you could say that seems reasonable because you're a busy practice. But over a third of those responses are never, um, are never returned with any sort of positive feedback or any feedback from the office. So one of three opportunities to potentially have a new patient visit your office aren't delivered. You know, some of these questions, may, maybe these three inquiries aren't always qualified patients, but the really savvy practices are treating every single inquiry as a potential patient and are doing a great job in making sure people get a quick response. And that really is great for the reputation. So that's all my, my conversation is. I will um, um, just say one last thing is if you like these kind of data-driven insights, I will be, um, we're running a workshop at um, a meeting in Vegas this summer and it's just at realselfdoctor.com. Ryan, thank you again for the opportunity. Tom, um, thanks so much for sharing those insights. And, yeah, a couple things that really jumped out at me is I think there's, between our findings and yours, there's this big contrast that we saw that these service-related communication time concerns really led. In your data sample, we see um, when on that much less likely event that someone leaves a negative review, um, it is more outcome-centric. I think that has a lot to do with the nature of your site and these rich, beautiful narratives that are there. But I think I felt a little bit validated in that in all procedures, the second most common concern was still communication. Um, and I think that, that continues to validate why um, this focus on services is, is important. Because like you said, I think for the most part, you know, those doctors are, are being good doctors. Um, in common, I guess, feeding back to your failure to respond and that silent reputation killers, what I'll share for our audience is we were surprised that in our data set how many of the negative reviews that we found were by people who never made it far enough to be seen or treated by the doctor. Um, and that's an important thing to note, I, you know, that that patient who you, whose email you failed to address is very likely to become um, one of, if not your first um, negative reviews because they're reviewing you as a service provider, not just as a, as a medical professional. So, um, you know, we're going to have some fantastic questions. I can already see a bunch coming in for, for Tom here um, on the right side of the screen. As a reminder, before we proceed to the rest of our audience, um, if you arrived later, uh, there is located on the right-hand side of the screen a questions panel that you're going to be able to use throughout the webinar today to share those questions. We're going to do our best to get through um, all of them before the end of the event. Um, but it is my great pleasure right now to introduce our next panelist, and that's Marie Olison. Um, Hi. Marie, I, actually, if I could just tell you a little bit yeah. of the audience about you, Marie, because I have to share, you're one of my favorite people in this industry. Um, when I started working in... Um, in aesthetic medicine about uh, 17 years ago now, um, I was very quickly made aware of a Marie through the work that she had done in creating a piece of software called Inform and Enhance. It was the, the first CRM system um, in this the, the field of cosmetic medicine, and it was a fantastic piece of software. And I think it was fantastic because um, Marie is actually the CEO of La Jolla Cosmetic Surgery Center and has that experience of you know, years and years working directly inside of an aesthetic clinic. 
Um, but the reason why I've asked her here today is actually a different side of who she is professionally, um, which is in her role in leading what's a, a, a site and a service called Real Patient Ratings. Um, it is one of my, I think, favorite vehicles that's available for co collecting really detailed patient feedback about how the clinic is doing. Um, and I, if you haven't learned about it, I strongly recommend everybody on the call check into it. Um, I will be clear for Marie and for everybody that we um, ever invite to um, speak to our client base. Uh, we have no commercial relationship. We don't expect uh, uh, accept um, any kind of referral commission or anything. And I, I say this just because I, I really value what she's giving back to the industry. Um, and I'm excited what she's going to give back to you today. So, um, Marie, with that said, I'm going to give you those keyboard and mouse controls and uh, pass the floor over to you. Okay, and I'm delighted to be here and, and uh, be a part of this illustrious panel. Um, I think the interesting thing about reputation management is everyone starts with it as a defensive strategy. And I think Tom alluded to it, and I want to most forcefully tell you that I think uh, repu what starts as reputation management is, is in fact, the most powerful practice growth strategy that I've experienced in years. And so I hope that I, what my intent here is to um, show you that when you're eliciting patient feedback and you're gaining uh, content in that feedback that you can use, um, Ryan, this is moving by itself here. Um, you're eliciting content that you can use um, to market and grow your practice. So we're going to have to do a pause here and go out and get this to stop moving itself. And I apologize because I inadvertently sent it to Ryan um, doing this. So let me talk to you a minute about where we are in real patient ratings. Um, we have now, we survey patients and patients have now answered 2.2 uh, million questions post-consult uh, and post-operatively in plastic surgery. And out of those questions, we have done four of the largest studies of um, drivers of likelihood to schedule and drivers of likelihood um, to retain and refer. And so when I look at patient behavior and patient feedback, what I'm looking to do is to looking at it in two levels. One, how can I learn where I'm disappointing my patients and at, proactively go in and fix those areas? And I can guarantee you, in spite of 25 years of surveying patients in my own practice, when I began a more a proactive process that I'm using through real patient ratings, I found areas of disappointment. And it was shocking and disappointing to me to know, but I began to act on fixing them. And so then once I'm able to fix those things, now obviously then my overall uh, response from the patient in terms of satisfaction ratings are going to improve. And then those improved satisfaction ratings are going to reflect in behavior uh, related to whatever the next step is, whether it's consultation behavior, then it's going to reflect in likelihood to schedule a consult. And if it's post-op satisfaction, then it's going to reflect in likelihood to retain and likelihood to refer. So again, what this distribution that I'm showing you here is very similar to what Tom was showing you. 78% uh, of um, patients are highly satisfied, about 17% satisfied, very low, neutral, dissatisfied, or highly dissatisfied. The name of the game, if you're trying to grow and strengthen your practice, is to figure out what are the things that you're doing that can move these satisfied patients to highly satisfied because you double their likelihood to schedule or their likelihood to refer. So this is looking at a distribution of um, uh, about 28,000 um, 
surveys, and you can see here that um, 22,000, I'll give you the numbers for this, 22,700 patients highly satisfied at the other end of the spectrum, only 250 patients highly dissatisfied. Now we do have within rail patient ratings the opportunity for the patient to express that they are highly dissatisfied, that they want to be contacted by the practice, and they want to resolve the problem privately and without going to a public forum. And I think that's extremely important that you learn how to listen within your practice and that in these days, if you don't learn to listen, that what's going to happen is if you give your patients no alternative but a public forum, then you are going to meet dissatisfaction on the internet. And uh, so you really have to look at yourself and say, what kind of listening systems do I have in place? And when someone is telling me or my nurse or my patient coordinator that they're unhappy, um, am I, what's, what's my plan? And you know the really good news is that all the um, consumer information about making an unhappy consumer happy is that there there's an increased lifetime value of that consumer, increased referral, increased spend from them. So there's sort of a joke in the consumer world that it, you start with trying to make everybody unhappy and then make them happy because in the end you actually get more business out of that relationship. Not that any of us really want to do that, but there is um, a motive. There's a good outcome from listening to satisfied patients. Now here's four members of real patient ratings, and this is just to show you that same distribution up across actual doctors with their own numbers of ratings. And you can see none of these doctors actually have a one-star review, and most of them have very few uh, two- or three-star reviews. So the ma vast majority of patients are very happy with their doctors. And so the risk of, you know, proactively going out and saying, I want to have a plan for seeking reviews, proactively publishing reviews, and um, making sure that I'm providing the content that patients are seeking. And um, there's a study out from Bright Local that says that during 2013, the number of searches for doctor name plus the word review grew by 51% surpass travel, and is now second only to restaurants. So if you think that you can avoid uh, what's happening out there um, in the, you know, sorry, it's tsunami of uh, patient interest in reading reviews in order to choose providers, it's here to stay. And really, these numbers show you um, you have nothing to fear. And so my best advice to you is embrace it because it will help you grow your practice. Now, what are, what are patients talking about? They're talking about, in, in, in mostly, they're talking about their patient experience. And this is what um, Ryan echoes. And certainly within our, our experience, they're talking within real patient ratings what the content of those uh, comments is relates to their experience rather than their specific surgical result. And so what creates that satisfaction? And you can see it's a group of things, um, understanding their needs, it's communication, it's materials they receive, it's how they can make appointments. These turn into perceptions of overall value, of likelihood to return or recommend, and certainly how we resolve problems is part of that overall satisfaction. Now, the key service complaints absolutely echo uh, what Ryan has found. They relate to time, communication, and money, and around these uh, core uh, issues of service. 
and then positive reviews are also around these core issues, but this time they're happy with them. And so, it, again, these are just, you know, along a spectrum. So now let's take these things and say how important are they? And for me, they're important in making my business stronger. And so uh, this is looking at a key driver study that we did of about 7,800 um, consult plastic, plastic surgery patients post-consult. And we were looking at that group who were only satisfied. And we were saying, what were the distinguishing characteristics between them and the patients who were highly satisfied who booked surgery? And so what were the missing components? And it, we, can, we can really drop, put these into two categories, which are communication and time. And um, eight of these really relate to communication by different people. Communication by the physician, number one driver, is the, is the physician making the patient feel comfortable, is easy to understand, does he do a thorough medical history, the nurse, helpful procedure information, and is the nurse um, helping to, uh, I really call it, make the patient trust and help the doctor, and then the staff friendliness and knowledge at the time of making the appointment. And then I'm going to just quickly go through here uh, just so that you can clearly get a feel for the value of making people happy relative to scheduling surgery. So if I'm dissatisfied on the, or highly dissatisfied with the number one driver of likelihood to schedule surgery, whether I'm comfortable with the surgeon, here's my likelihood to schedule. If I'm highly satisfied, here's my likelihood to schedule. So this is, should be a pretty big motivator for the surgeon to make sure that you're making the patient feel comfortable. Secondarily, uh, taking time to explain the consult process so the patient isn't confused. Because when they're ha highly satisfied with understanding what's going on, what the next steps are, who's going to be involved, big impact on likelihood to schedule. Friendliness of the person who scheduled the appointment you would think that this, this isn't going to come into play on likelihood to schedule, but it clearly has an impact. Overall wait time, if they're not happy, they're not scheduling. So if you're saying, should I do something about my schedule until the overall response of people waiting in my waiting room for their consultation is that they're highly satisfied with their wait time? My answer would be, are you highly satisfied with your surgical schedule? Because if you're highly dissatisfied with your surgical schedule and they're highly dissatisfied with their wait time, we have a clear solution for both of you. And then uh, for those of you who uh, offer uh, financing plans or payment plans for patients, uh, the point at which you discuss that can have a, a high impact on scheduling rates. And the sooner it's done, in fact, at the initial call, um, the better it will be to impact scheduling rates. And then just uh, two quick last points. Um, when comments come through our system, um, what we do is we send these to the staff and to the practice for review and approval. And this for publishing on the practice website, but it's also highly motivating for everyone to see what um, the patients feel about their experience and the things that they say about their experience. And it's rewarding and um, um, just motivates everyone uh, because I think we don't hear enough back from each other. And hearing it from our patients and how they perceive us um, is, is, is wonderful. And then the last thought that I would like to give you is that when you think about um, your marketing plan and how you uh, grow and think about your practice, this, this search 
is one that you have to be looking at all the time. What is happening for your name plus the word reviews? And this is something that an entire, you know, Ryan and an entire team of people have to be helping you with. But it, what appears here is going to be the result of the service you deliver, the attention that you have to detail, and you, it's imperative these days because this is how people are making uh, decisions about choosing you on a daily basis. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks so much, Maria. I, I think that uh, there's a couple points in there that I, I want to be sure to, to draw attention to because um, I, I think that it you, you touched on it briefly enough that the audience may have missed it. And, and it was that correlation between um, wait time and scheduling of services inside the office. And I've heard you share that statistic before um, on other panels that we've done together. And I think it's such an important one because it's so often overlooked by the staff. It's easy. We, we become flustered. The doctor's running behind. A patient needed extra attention. And there's a waiting room full of people who never hear, hey, guys, we want to let you know in advance. This is what's happening. It's going to be a little while before um, we've got this situation resolved. But you know, we're going to take good care of you. If we need to reschedule, let's do that now. And, and patients who are driving in who would benefit so much from hearing, hey, we're running 45 minutes behind in the office today. Would you still like to keep your appointment? Or, or can we get you in on a different date um, so that their days aren't impacted? And it's, it's, it's insights like that that I hope that people on the call today take away. Because that correlation, again, between service on the front end and you being able to sell services on the back end um, inside your clinic is fascinating. So thank you so much, Marie. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for people who've just joined us, um, you may not have heard in the very beginning, we're accepting questions throughout the webinar today. On the uh, GoToWebinar uh, control panel that's located on the right-hand side of your screen, there is an area labeled questions. We've already got some uh, fantastic ones in there that we will be addressing at the end of the session. Uh, a couple people have written in that they've got colleagues who are not able to connect today. We'll never worry. Um, this webinar and all the webinars that Aetna Interactive hosts uh, we record them. They become available usually within two business days in our learning center. And everyone who is registered will receive a link so that they can watch um, watch this playback and either learn from it again or share it with uh, with their friends and colleagues. Um, at this time, I, I want to take a moment to introduce you to another fa fantastic panelist. Um, her name is Glenn Morley. I had the, the, the great fortune of um, meeting Glenn. Gosh, I think it was maybe almost eight years ago now. Um, and or 11. Just, oh, has it been that long already? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it's, we're, we're both showing our age a little bit, our age right. industry at least. And um, we've had a lot of opportunities to consult directly with uh, both private practices and then groups of practices together. And um, I, I don't know that there's anybody out there that I respect more than Glenn when it comes to providing really hard-hitting advice to, to clinics about what they're doing well and where they can improve and what that path to improvement looks like. So when I was looking for somebody to um, wrap this up, it was, for me, it was an, a really easy choice to reach out to Glenn and, and say, well, how do we put this together now? You know, we've learned that reviews matter, that people are reading into the depths of the reviews, and, and that service concerns, if we're going to get concerns, that they are probably going to lead the charge in terms of what people are exposed to. Um, and so Glenn's going to be talking about um, what do we do in response to this new knowledge? Now, um, she consults today with Karen Zepko and Associates working with medical practices um, in practice development, situational leadership, um, behavioral style assessment and how to manage that, the financial analysis. She works in practice valuations, helps practices with HR, and spends a lot of time training practices in the area of service. And she's been doing it for more than 20 years. Um, I listen to her all the time, and I'm going to encourage you to listen to her advice now. That said, Glenn, I'm going to turn the uh, keyboard and mouse controls over to you and ask you to take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you for having me as part, of, as part of the panel today. I also want to thank all the listeners who've carved out time to join us today. Um, what I'd like to help you with today um, is to understand the power that's before you with wonderful data, insights shared by Tom Seary, um, Murray Olson, and of course Ryan Miller. We have so much to work with. And so if you're not 
currently engaging in a dialogue with patients in the form of anonymous experience surveys um, or things like that, you're not harnessing the potential. You're not um, focusing your energies in um, the areas that offer the biggest opportunities. For me, these sorts of surveys, these sorts of conversations with patients are a real roadmap. And um, practices that lack that really are working without direction. In fact, we're so, um, we're so focused on providing high quality that sometimes uh, it seems sort of mystifying when patients don't book for us. And for that reason, dialogue and consistently asking for patient feedback um, gives us deeper understanding and clarity. Um, I am sure that all of you have read different articles, um, been to different talks around patient-centered care, and it's been a hot topic in practices um, seeking ways to differentiate themselves in today's competitive marketplace. And despite all of the discussions, what I find over and over is that practices struggle with what this means in terms of actual service delivery. So today we're going to um, try to demystify some of that um, and dissect a few different key points of contact that I think we all experience on a daily basis and that our, our patients experience on a daily basis. <clears throat> and we'll, some, we'll explore some real solutions, which um, hopefully you can implement immediately. Okay, here we go. So I think it's important to discuss perceptions and perception management. As Ryan mentioned, I am fascinated by behavior. Um, I'm fascinated by interactions that I observe in practices. I'm fascinated by conversations that I listen in on and you know our different reactions to what patients say um, and sometimes uh, lack of reaction to what patients say. So I think that taking a step back with a survey and um, highlighting certain words when we do get direct feedback can be very beneficial. You'll notice in this uh, table that I've highlighted certain words. So these are observations from a survey, observations made by patients. And some of the observations you'll see included words like rushed, abrupt, um, overwhelmed. And I think it's important that we focus on these sorts of emotionally driven observations and understand what these perceptions really mean. So if I am a patient and I felt rushed when I called the practice, more than likely I felt like I wasn't valued. I may have felt like I was interrupting them by calling the practice. And so as a practice manager, as um, a practice owner, you know, you really need to take the next step and question um, what we sound like and really put in place some ways to understand what we sound like. Um, and it may be certain periods of the day, it may be certain days of the week when we're really slammed, but we need to understand uh, when, when we are at our busiest, what our patients are experiencing. I'll touch on another. Um, uh, went to voicemail again and again. And the perception that that might lead to would be that this practice is just too busy for me. If that's an, a potential surgical patient, then it would really make me, as a practice manager or owner or staff person, I would examine that protocol. If we see a trend, if we're hearing the trend communicated in surveys back from patients, um, then we want to understand why this protocol is in place. Is it solving a practice issue that um, you know, is, is um, no longer necessary, or could we move beyond voicemail and respond to patients in a more meaningful way that helps them feel valued? Historically, in the marketing world, we focused on product and service, place, price, and promotion. And I want to tell you that in every practice I work in, an outstanding job is being done in all four of these areas. Beautiful offices, um, a myriad of products and services, 
pricing is perhaps um, an area of opportunity because I would like to see less um, fixation on pricing. Um, and what I'd really love to see more of is a focus on personnel and specifically on the development of personnel. Um, so if we could focus on understanding how to better manage people's perceptions of us, if we could focus a little bit more on understanding how to communicate with different behavioral styles or different personalities, I think it would be a huge bang for the buck because patients today are not the patients of yesterday. Um, patients of yesterday booked an appointment with us, they came in for a consultation, they listened attentively when we told them what they should do, and more than likely they did it. But that's not today's patient. Today's patient wants engagement, and no matter where they are in the decision-making continuum, they want us to uh, be the experts and engage in a dialogue that helps them make an informed decision. So if we can develop ourselves and develop our people in these areas, it will pay huge dividends. As we know, um, that first impression is critical, and it's formed in seconds, not minutes. So what does amazing sound like? If that becomes our goal and we are committed to being amazing, I think we have to really understand what perceptions are being formed when we're on the phone. A disturbing trend that I've seen is that uh, practices don't necessarily focus on relationship building type questions um, in initial new cosmetic consultations or even when a consultation appointment is scheduled. And it's a critical point for us to align our interests and the practice and the patients. We want them to know that we're the right people to talk to and we want to ask questions that help them share their story. So instead of uh, thinking in terms of educating patients, I think there's a real ground shift going on towards empowering patients to make better decisions. And that should drive some of the questions that we start asking. So if nothing else after today, rethink some of the key questions that we're asking in the very, very early stage of our relationship with patients. We have a very focused, very small window of time to get um, some answers. And the answers to these questions will profoundly change the, the new patient consultation experience. If we, if we understand the answers to these questions well in advance of a new patient consultation, then when the patient arrives in the practice, we are um, ready to, to speak with them at any point in that decision-making process. So when I work with staff, um, one of the things that I typically find, even when I share these questions with the staff, what I typically find is there's an eagerness to get the answer, but um, a, probably not enough time spent listening to the answer. And so I'd like to also encourage everyone to think in terms of listening more and talking less. By asking smart, open-ended questions, we're automatically asking patients to tell their story. But we really have to listen and make critical notes in the patient record in our practice management systems so that we're not the only person listening to the story, so that all of our colleagues and the physician that will be engaging with the patient is also a part of that patient story. And that leads me to sort of the next step um, in creating an amazing experience for your patient. Um, I think it's important when we decide that we're going to have a transparent environment and begin to collaborate towards improvement um, that there are some ground rules in place for real change. Um, case practices um, need to share with staff and even physicians that they're in safe territory and that they can share feedback that they receive from patients and know that there aren't going to be ramifications if the stories um, or if the feedback about a provider or the feedback about a staff person's um, conversation, if that's a negative experience for a patient. 
we need to know that it's okay to discuss those and to troubleshoot those without um, you know, any repercussions because it's only in, in exploring them and understanding them that we can begin to anticipate um, similar situations in the future and develop clear and real answers for them. So the practices that um, I work with are amazing. I have such admiration and respect for the hard work that's done every day, but the most talented among the superstars have gone way beyond good to amazing by focusing on this sort of culture of respect when it comes to hearing things that we don't like um, and remaining professional and forward thinking, um, sort of solutions oriented. So what are some of the things that I see um, in practices that are hyper-focused on this? Um, I have seen uh, recently um, some pretty interesting things out in the marketplace. One, um, for instance, is called Interact, Interaction, Interaction Metrics. Um, and this is a company owned by uh, Martha Brooks um, out on the West Coast. And it's um, a tool that allows practices to record a certain number of um, phone calls and interaction metrics sort of dissects those calls and assigns metrics to different points of the call. So this is not for every practice, but it for sure it's interesting and um, potentially there for practices that are very, very serious about improving the patient experience. The, the sorts of things that I'm listening for when I listen to these calls are whether or not the staff is um, providing the phone, phone script type answers or whether they've moved beyond that, if they're actually hearing the question behind the question that the patient is asking, if they're able to differentiate the practice for the patient and help the patient understand um, you know, what we're all about. So I think in, in um, moving sort of to another level, it's critical that you start to listen to yourself and understand what you sound like, what your practice sounds like, um, so that improvements can be made. So Glenn, as you, as you keep going, I want to encourage everybody who's on the call, I know that we've hit the hour now. Um, we've got a little ways to go, and there's some fantastic questions waiting for our Q&A. Um, we're going to go long. Don't worry about it. Um, we're going to be recording this part as well. For those of you that may need to drop off, um, you'll be able to catch the, the last few minutes here um, in the recording that will go out in just a few days' time. Um, but Glenn, I, want, I don't want you to rush. I want you to, to focus on delivering the rest of your content because this is fantastic. Oh, okay. Thanks, Ryan. I don't know. Where did that hour go? <laughs> so um, the corporate world is fascinating to me, and I'm sure it is to you too, because uh, the corporate world spends huge sums of money on employee, employee de development. And interestingly, Apple has replaced the word unfortunately with as it turns out. And they've done this because um, it makes a huge difference. If we um, were to get a call, and we all get crazy calls every day. Um, for instance, I was in a practice the other day and a patient called and asked if we did a one minute facelift. And I was thrilled because the answer that was given was, as it turns out, Dr. Smart has developed a facelift that's perfectly suited for patients looking for a quick recovery. And um, so instead of saying, no, we don't offer that, this person that worked in this practice, a true superstar, really turned it into an opportunity to talk to the patient, engage them in a meaningful dialogue, and find out what they really wanted, you know, the question behind the question. Other things that um, are kind of no-brainers and I would love to never hear again <laughs> would be not a problem. And I hear this in response um, to thank yous all the time. And what I'd much rather hear in a practice is certainly, or my pleasure, that's why I'm here. Um, because um, we are different and we are better and um, our patients need to understand that. I'd like to replace I don't know with great question, let me find out for you. And what this communicates to patients is that um, we are a resource. We don't have every answer and I want to release everyone on this 
call from the belief that you must know everything. The really bright, the really resourceful know that even if they don't have the answer, they can find the answer. They can connect a patient to the right answer, and that's really what patients are looking for. What I'd like to see, um, this is not advancing for some reason, Ryan. Oh, there we go. I'd love to see um, an absence of the blame game. And instead of ever hearing, well, I can't imagine who scheduled you that way, or he's always running late, um, I'd love to hear staff respond with something positive and forward-looking, which is more like, we'll, well, let's see what I can do to help you. Again, that's why I'm here. Because our, at the end of the day, we're trying to, you know, feel, feel, um, make the patient feel great about their experience with us. Um, another service opportunity in most practices is returning calls very promptly. Within an hour is a must. Um, under an hour would be amazing. I also want to acknowledge that in our busy days, in our busy practices, that things go wrong and 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 um, we aren't perfect. But what we want to communicate and what we want to um, show our patients is a calm, professional um, presence, even if underneath the water our paddles are furious, furiously going. So um, every practice is going to have different opportunities. Every practice is going to be constructing different solutions. At the end of the day, what we want to do is align your solutions with the real patient concerns. And the real patient concerns are available to us if we have the courage to you know, ask the right questions, if we're willing to survey our patients at every um, sort of touch point at a new patient consultation or right afterwards, post-operatively surveying patients. Um, and I think that you'll find, like um, I have, that it becomes a roadmap of to-dos. So as a result of today, I'd love to think that each one of you can develop a specific and clear action plan for poor service perceptions. Um, I'd love to know that um, as you focus in on things that might not be going perfectly, that you create a judgment-free zone with, a, with the idea that we're, we're seeking to dazzle our patients. And um, at the conclusion of every visit, be confident enough to say, is there anything that we could have done to make your experience with us better? And if we can get to the point that we can ask any patient that question, we'll know that we and all of our team um, has done the best job possible to create um, you know, that sort of um, office environment. So I want to thank Ryan um, for having me as a part of this panel. It's been an honor and a privilege. And I'll turn things back over to Ryan. Well, excellent, Glenn. Thanks so much. And, and thanks to everyone who has uh, stayed on the line with us. I want to just take one second to remind everyone that you can use that question box, box over on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and for all of our panelists who may have turned themselves on mute, um, I want to uh, encourage you to unmute yourselves because this is the part where we're going to ask maybe for the last five minutes to get some, uh, some brief answers to the, the questions from our audience. And I want to take a, a second before we dive in there myself to uh, Marie, Tom, Glenn, thank you all so much for being so generous of your time. For those that are on the line, you may not be aware how much effort it takes in, the, in advance of these events to coordinate everybody um, with all of us having such busy schedules. And, and our sincere hope is that uh, um, the time that we've invested is really going to make um, a difference for you as you focus on the area of service inside of your practices, not just for the benefit of patients, but also for the benefit of, uh, of your practice and your reputation. Um, thank you again all very much. Now let's dive into some questions. Now, there's an interesting question that's come in, and this is really a, a, about um, what recourses practice, practices have in general about unsatisfactory reviews and ratings, um, specifically that are appearing on social channels. Um, the question asks legal or otherwise. None of us are lawyers, so we probably won't give a legal perspective. But Tom, can you maybe speak a little bit about on, on real self, because there, there's a lot of parallels there when we look at other reputable places that reviews might be left and what recourse a physician has or what they can do in response to um, unsatisfactory or negative reviews. 
Yeah, I uh, thanks, um, and I apologize. The um, the sidewalk cleaning has commenced uh, again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, uh, well, okay. Um, well, part of the the I, I know this is sort of like a person who's facing this right now is not going to like this sort of feedback point, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is you know echoes many of the conversation points we're making today, which is the amplitude or impact of that negative review and your concern of it is a direct relationship to how many reviews you have on the web. Um, that that said, if it's a really exhaustive, like this doctor's terrible and this person has made it their personal agenda to go across the web and destroy you, there's a lot of services that have an anti-agenda policy. Um, there's a lot of services that have terms of service that state what what's allowed and not allowed. And and most of the modern uh, operations like the Yelps and, and others out there adhere to those and listen to it. So it's inflammatory language and so forth um, that uh, is, is completely inaccurate. The 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 discuss path to dispute resolution may be and I maybe even toss this over to Marie um, is potentially if you know the patient is to engage that person and try to address their concern, just like I showed you that example of the person who went from one star to four star. Um, and if we do believe and posit in our hypothesis is that you know the reason people are more negative online is due to communication breakdown, what if you try to reconnect with that person and try to reason with them about or to provide, you know, listen to them? And sometimes I hear doctors say that a patient has no idea how how personally harmful it was to you to get to, to the practice to have them say such things on the web. They didn't realize, and they were, they're working from a point of anger, but can be reasoned with and rational. So um, that that's not necessarily, there's no quick answer, but typically it's not one where the answer is go run to your lawyer, but I'm not going to lawyer on this call, but I, it's typically going to your lawyer is going to give you the answer of there's not much you can do these days. As consumers, there's, there's the First Amendment, and unless they're doing things that are completely um, like calling you the you know a, a murderer, um, there's there may not be much you can do about those negative views are out in the wild. Yeah, and I think um, this is Marie. I'll just add quickly here. Uh, there's I just found a little service which is called Review Concierge, and they do help you pose. Uh, they monitor you on about seventy five review sites, and they do give you advice. And um, I'm, I've started using them. I find them very helpful. And I do. I have had experience with people posting negative reviews on Yelp and reaching out privately. And now these people have suggested that I post publicly, saying, "I'm very disappointed to hear you're, that you are unhappy. Please contact me, or I, if I can't figure out who it is." And we we don't want anyone unhappy, and we want to work with you to resolve this. And I've had success with several patients then taking down their, either taking down their negative posting or coming back and rewriting their posting, similar to the one that you showed, Tom, which is to say, I never thought they'd care or listen or read what I had to say, and not only did they do all of that, but they helped me resolve my problem. And these are really wonderful people. So um, I think it's very much worth trying to engage. Yeah, no, definitely. And it, we have a little bit of a conflict of interest in that we we sell that same service, Marie. We we offer that same oh, kind of monitoring okay. and consultation. But okay. you know, I'll share that it, to to both of your points. One, being aware of what's being said is important. So um, whether you're using an, an automated or human approach to monitoring, you need to you need to be aware that the negative reviews are happening. Um, some sites, if they really are inflammatory, like Tom said, and they violate a terms of service, there's a possibility of having it removed. Um, but to both of their points, actually working to achieve resolution, I think, is really, um, really at the heart of, of of how you fix a situation like that. Um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to ask you guys to comment on another question, and um, I, I think I, I actually I, this is going to be another one that hits up for Marie and Tom. I, I think I know what your answer is, but. The, the, the writer asked, do you have any suggestions for monthly awards or contests for those patients who are doing reviews? Um, yeah, maybe, Tom, I'll, I'll ask you to jump in on this one first. Uh, yeah. What is your policy about incentivizing patient reviews? Yeah, don't do it. Um, it's not even, yeah, 
It's beyond our policy, and it's, it's, it's actually to FTC and law. Um, exactly. To give incentives to patients. Um, they have to reveal those incentives. And attorney generals in states like New York and Florida are really eager to make case studies and case examples of, of, of folks who are gaming systems in their minds and in their opinion through in, um, hidden incentives or offers. And, and that, that, by the way, that same policy needs to apply to don't have your, your practice you know, members, team members posting on sites about you as well. That's biased. And, and in, in the end, social media, things just come out. And you just don't need people to say, you know, like an unhappy staff member leaves and says, yeah, we were forced to write positive reviews on Yelp. That's not good for your reputation. So just do it the right way, which is to naturally, organically allow your patient base to speak out. Because I, as I've already stated, you're doing a good job. And Marie's Day even shows even more enhanced of you're doing not only a good job, um, the majority of you are doing a great job. So I, I think along the same lines, I'll, I'll, I'll add in that in most states, the medical licensing boards prevents false fraudulent misleading advertising. And if you have a staff member who's going out to publish a review and doesn't disclose that they are staff members, um, you're getting into some really gray and murky waters because it's inherently misleading if they're not disclosing a relationship. Um, most sites prevent, um, you know, Yelp has active policies against this, and as Tom mentioned, um, legally you're getting in, into some dangerous space if you are incentivizing um, patients to game, uh, game a system like a review site. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the, maybe the, the last question as we look at this is, um, it, we're, we've run quite long, but I want to ask you, if there's one thing tomorrow that you want the practices who participate today to either remember or to go out and act on, um, and I didn't prepare you for this, so um, I'll, I'll let whoever's ready first go first, but what's that one takeaway you hope that everybody's going to leave with today? I know exactly what mine would be. This is Glenn. Please. I would love for um, every practice with new patients to listen to the patient's story in the very beginning and um, not be so eager to provide too much information that n might be irrelevant, off topic, um, and frankly annoying to new patients. We have to listen to the patient story first. Excellent. Um, Tom, circling back to you, one, one takeaway you really would like to see the audience hold? Yeah, just like you stated in the beginning, just don't let that one review um, set you down a path of this is just an awful thing that needs to go away. Um, reviews ultimately become and will be your most important source of word of mouth marketing. And to that end, the one advice point um, that I like to always give is make the request of getting a re you know a patient to give their feedback um, something that you workflow into your practice. You have postcards, you have business cards, you have emails, you have all sorts of ways of reaching out to the patient. And I know it puts doctors and sometimes a practice in a bit of an awkward position, but it's so common now, everywhere you go, people asking for feedback, that um, it, it's actually becoming a, 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 an expected experience at almost every transactional level. So I, that's the one point I would, I would emphasize. Excellent, Tom. And, and Marie, what about from you? Well, I think that we can't define for our um, patient or our customer what they um, are supposed to think. We have to be guided by what's important to them. And I see a lot of people thinking what ought to be important to the patient. And so you need a feedback system. And you need to be guided by what's important to them. And just don't worry about whether you think it's important. If the data shows it's important to them and it's driving uh, the behavior that that you want from them, i.e. to choose you or to stay with you and refer their friends and family, then go with, go with it. Excellent. Well, Marie, Tom, and Glenn, I want to thank the three of you for, particip for participating. And of course, to all of our attendees today, uh, our last little plug here is if you enjoyed the webinar and you're not already on our newsletter, um, be sure to uh, subscribe online at interactive.com forward slash newsletter so that you don't miss information about our upcoming uh, webinars uh, in the uh, in the near future. Again, thank you, everyone, and we'll wish you the very best.